Hello again everyone and welcome back to the Vintage Sewing Machine Garage channel. If you are new to this channel, feel free to put the describe button. If you'll push that, you will be a subscriber. Uh, there is no cost to do so. And you can also click the little bell symbol and it will remind you when I post a new video. Uh, that is certainly there for you. Uh, many people come here and never even think about it. Uh, so, I am making this video uh, of a Singer 401A. Now this is not the first 401A uh, by Singer that I've ever done videos on. You all have seen me work on them before uh, and I've spoken about them and what is so amazing about them and also what can be fussy. All machines, no matter how wonderful they are, doesn't matter the brand, all machines do something really well, many things well, and all machines have their Achilles heels. Every single machine does, but it doesn't matter because they, they can be so awesome. And if you have your favorite machine, uh, you may not even notice any of its flaws because you just, you're used to it. Maybe you've sewn on it for 30 years, but uh, they're just like automobiles in a way or anything else, any other kind of machine we deal with. Uh, but today I wanted to create a video where I am going to try a different approach in terms of waking up a sewing machine. 95% of all the sewing machines I have ever gotten or rescued uh, were asleep. They were not ready to run. Even if the seller said, well, the needle goes up and down, it runs fine. Most of the time, those folks mean well. Uh, I would say probably, I don't know, 90% of the time or more, they're being honest, they're just mistaken. They, they don't know, many of them don't sew, and they thankfully they, they thought enough to, to hold on to it, not throw it in the garbage, uh, or to a scra you know, to a, some sort of recycle center, but that's all they know, and they just, you know, they wanna sell it, and maybe they think it's rare, this machine is not rare, but that doesn't mean it isn't wonderful. For those of you who are new to the Singer 401A or any of the Singers from this era, this machine is part of what I call the, uh, I consider it an heirloom quality machine. And by that, I mean it is all metal, it is restorable, uh, you can get parts for it, and if it is cared for and maintained, this machine literally can be handed down to another generation or two or three. That sounds like an exaggeration, but it really isn't because this thing was brand new 1956, 1957, and that's a long time ago, folks, and it's not worn out. Uh, it looks a little dirty. There's some, you know, there's some stains. It's got dust on it. Uh, and I'm trying something today here to kind of show you um, a, a different approach I'm going to take. And when I say different, it's not really that different to waking up machine. Uh, what I thought I would do, and I, I have to share with you where I got this idea from. I, I was looking at washing machines and uh, yeah, this is how exciting things get around here. I was looking at washing machines and studying the specifications because of getting one. And one of the machines had a cycle on it. It was called pre-soak so that you can put water in the machine and, and you can soak clothing if it's particularly soiled. And pre-soaking just helps uh, break up stains and stuff. And um, don't worry, this, this video is not about washing machines. But the idea of pre-soaking something and letting it sit, I thought, well, let's try that. So this is, I have not touched this machine. This machine has been sitting for, I'm gonna say 15 years, maybe 20. Now, those of you who've seen my videos, if you have not, please go back. You will see lots of videos I've made on the Singer 401A. The Singer 401A was a tour de force. It was the fanciest, most featured machine that Singer could pull off, except for the one that I'm going to show in my next video. <laughs> and um, it was crazy expensive, right? 1956, 1957, you had, if you chose the 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 this model, the 401A, there were lesser, you know, less featured models you could get at Singer, of course, but this model, oh gosh, it has so many built-in stitches, and it even takes a few, I think there are five or six, something like that, extra uh, uh, decorative stitch cams, because they couldn't fit all of the metal cams in here, uh, and you can use those cams if you so desire. And of course, you have needle position adjustment right here, and of course, uh, 
uh, stitch length adjustment. That shouldn't shock anyone. Uh, but, but this was Singer's second attempt at a zigzag machine, and they finally got it right. And as I go through this, I'm going to talk a little bit about what is so incredible about this machine. And then, as I often like to say, every sewing machine brand and every model of every brand, they all have little idiosyncrasies, right? You could call them weaknesses or Achilles heels, but I really just want to call them uh, idiosyncrasies because, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what machine, I don't care if it's European, American, Japanese, there are all sorts of little things that they they are, um, they, they just have their own needs and you need to go along with them uh, and they will play nice with you or they can get cranky. But this again happens with any sewing machine, not just this one. So why do I say that? The Singer 401A had more features and could do more than any Singer domestic sewing machine up until that time. It was the most tech advanced, I know we think of tech as digital and electronic, but this was truly, it's an analog machine, but it could do all sorts of things. And it did them mechanically, right? So there's no panel here, like on a new machine, you push a button and the computer tells the needle, hey, go over here and do this. It's all done mechanically, which means it was really expensive to produce. Uh, and that reflected its price. Remember, back in this time period, when you looked at the prices of almost any consumer product, particularly one that was mechanical, you know, that, that uh, it was an appliance of some sort, the quality of the base level singers was the same as the top of the line model like this one. The difference was you paid more for features but not for quality. The quality was fantastic across the board, but you just had to pay uh, every time you added a feature. This machine had almost all of Singer's features. Uh, and in North America, this was typically the top of the line. It was marketed that way and you pay top dollar. I mean, big money. The majority of people who bought this, this machine, they paid for it on time. They made payments. They didn't just walk in and get that sucker unless they were wealthy. So now I mentioned that all machines had have idiosyncrasies. Why? What is what is the uh, the uh, what is so um, idiosyncratic or what's the Achilles heel of this machine? Some sewing machines uh, are less forgiving than others when they sit still. All sewing machines, when they go to sleep, can be cranky. You, you all have seen me, if you've watched my channel, you have seen me try to wake up a lot of cranky machines. Even basic, you know, salt of the earth, straight stitch singers can be cranky. And those machines only have, you know, one mission. They move the needle up and down. Uh, and that's what they have to do or go in reverse. Well, every time you add a feature and you ask a machine to do something, it adds complexity. Now, that doesn't take away from its quality. The quality of everything in this machine is incredible. But when you add complexity, you add... Uh, basically, there are more areas in this machine to wake up. Overhauling this machine will take me a good 30%, 40% longer than a straight stitch singer would or a straight stitch machine, period because there's just more to, 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 uh, to take a look at, to clean, to overhaul, to adjust. Um, and there's more to wake up, basically. And so I always want to qualify when I say these things, because I don't want people to think, oh, I don't want a Singer 401, it's cranky. No. If you have a machine that is running beautifully and you take care of it, or you have a machine that has been woken up and restored, your 401A should run like a top. Not a problem. The point here is that machines that are that are fully featured like this one, and this would also apply to the Singer 500 and and any other brands too, the Berninas, the the, the German Pfaffs, um, you name it. The more complex the machine, the less uh, willing it is to go to sleep for a long period and then just wake up and sew for you. If I'm hopefully I'm uh, communicating that clearly, so. This machine has lots of moving parts. It has lots of stuff that it can do and lots of areas that get stuck and go to sleep. So we're going to wake that up today, wake them up today. So how are we going to do this? First, I'm going to 
take my little brush here and basically what I'm going to do is just get the dust off. Before you put anything, oil, penetrant oils or the valve oil I'm going to use, get as much dust out as you can because dust and oil end up making this strange goopy mud material that just makes it harder for you to clean. Um, it is, uh, it's not the end of the world, but you know, you're just making work for yourself. So what am I going to do here? I am going to just take the brush and just any soft brush that you have. Don't use anything that's got stiff bristles. Um, this, this, that's not necessary. And now some of you may decide to use the, um, I've shown you that computer accessory vacuum attachment I have, and I could use that. But I'm, you know, the amount of dust I'm dealing with here is, is not severe. And yeah, I could drag the vacuum out or I can just do this. It's, uh, you know, it's not, uh, let's put the camera down here. It's not that big a deal. And uh, I'm not going to get all of the dust, but I want to get, you know, as much as I can just to, uh, I'll probably get my, my, uh, my lint brush and get down here in the, uh, in the feed dog area. And you know, that's basically what I'm going to do. The next thing I'm going to do, let's pivot back up. I'm going to take the lid off of this machine so that you all can see a lot of these complex mechanical parts that I'm speaking of. And that, <laughs> that, that has sat for a while. That has not been opened in a long time. I think of all the things that surprise me the most about these machines is that they actually will wake up, that they are, they're willing to, to come back to life in spite of just sitting and not being used. I restored a, um, a 500A, which is, uh, it was the next series. And those of you who know these machines know the 500A is essentially, for the most part, the same machine, except it has a different styling, right? It came out in 1958. And uh, people, the fans of that machine have nicknamed it the Rocketeer. That was not a name Singer gave to it. But now you can see underneath here, we just got yeah, some old oil, not, no big deal. We have, we have one of the two spool pins. The other one is missing. Now in the hole here, I, I, I don't see a remnant. So it must have fallen out, which is much more that's preferable to breaking off. I've had to get them out before, but I have, you can get replacements for these. I even keep a few extra, they're really cheap, and that will be easy. That's an easy fix uh, as, as far as uh, sewing machine restoration goes. We'll set that aside. Now, let's take a look here. I think I'm gonna try tilting machine toward us. And let you take a look at all of this. <laughs> when I said, this machine, this sewing machine has a lot of mechanical parts. I wasn't kidding. Look at that. So behind all of this, uh, all these levers on the front, you see all of the mechanical uh, goings on, for lack of a better simple term. And all of this was necessary for this machine to do all of the fancy stuff it did. Remember, without a computer, you have to mechanically get this, this, uh, all of this stuff to happen. Uh, I can see down in here uh, some old oil looks grease. Now, now you'll notice I'm gonna just. This is a very gentle test, right? So if I move this indicator, notice I'm getting some movement of the parts here. Watch this. You'll see. You'll see things moving, but it's very slow and stiff. Not a surprise. If you have one of these machines and it, it barely wants to move and it's kind of slow, that should not surprise you. And that's true of any machine and especially this one. Now, these knobs uh, are always a good reason and a good reminder of always read your manual if you are new to a machine. There are people who have broken this because they didn't know how to use it, okay? Uh, when you, and the manual would tell you this, of course, but let's suppose that you are, 
brand new to the machine, right? And you see all of these combinations, these, these two dials, there's a dial on the front, this beige, and then the cream color dial, they do different things, but they combine to create settings to allow the machine to create all these wonderful decorative stitches it can do. With this knob, the beige on the front, you push it in, and then you turn it with the cream knob, you pull it out toward you, and you try to turn it. Now, this is, again, I've, I've handled enough of these to know, of course, it's, it's moving. The fact that it even moves is, is pretty cool. Um, but, again, this is one of those areas, I, when I restored the 500A for uh, a client, I told them, I said, they were giving it as a gift to someone. I said, this is a fantastic machine. It has been overhauled. Tell the person you're giving this to, even if they go through a period where they don't sew much, just, just fire it up and let it run. Let it move. Put it through its paces with some stitches just on some remnant cloth. These machines are happy when they get used at least occasionally. Now, I don't know how to define occasionally for you. Maybe a couple of times a year. And oil them and let them move. When they sit, they get cranky. All machines do. And the Singer 400, 500, and 600 Slantomatics, they get extra cranky. They're not doomed, but they're, you know, they're going to fuss. This machine is going to come back to life and we're going to have her running great. But it's going to... It's going to fuss and whine until we, until we do for it what it was meant to have, okay? So, I know this ahead of time, so I'm not even going to try to, you know, don't force it and make it. This plastic is fine. It's been fine since 1956, 57, and it will last just fine as long as, and this is a great way to show all of you things I've, I've mentioned many times before. You see all the steel behind the plastic. When that steel is free and moving and lubricated and it's happy, the plastic is fine. The plastic was designed to be able to turn. It's attached to the steel and it will be fine. You're not gonna harm the plastic as long as you take care of the metal. I, I know I've mentioned this before, but it is a super, some of you may see this video and you've never seen any of my other videos before and I really wanna, I, I, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to get things on the inside moving and then you can, um, once you've gotten things on the inside going, then of course you, you, should, you should have much better luck with your, your, uh, your plastic dials and buttons and levers and, and so forth. Okay, I noticed when I was checking down here, and again, if you have a machine, it, it could be this one or almost any vintage sewing machine. This is the lever that, that is for changing the level of the feed dogs. Now on this series of machines, um, and this is true of the 400, 500, 600 series, the, the feed dogs actually don't drop. What happens is the plate rises, and the, re the result is you can move fabric here without the feed dogs touching it, and that's for darning and free motion work. No surprise that this machine, like almost every other one I've ever held, handled, people either rarely or never used this feature, and because of that, it's almost always stuck. Now, sometimes... I, this lever should be willing to flip to the left and it says nope it doesn't want to can I try to force it yeah wouldn't be smart no 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 don't do that just leave it be <laughs> don't 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 uh, you know don't 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 get too far ahead of this machine so that we're gonna we're gonna do this this pre soak thing I'm gonna try uh, a new way of, of, of addressing uh, issues of frozen or sleepy machines. We're going to try this and see, see how it works. So uh, let's take a look at our uh, feed dock area as well as this area. And I'm, what I'm basically looking for here is just, you know, any lint that's, uh, you know how gravity goes. Uh, this machine, by the way, was the machine, the last singer that I got in my blonde... That giant, um, beautiful blonde singer table from the 50s, the one that has, it looks like an airplane when you open it up. It's got this huge uh, work area. And it's just been sitting in there, but, you know, I've only had it, what, was it 24 months now or something? That's nothing compared to, <laughs> it had been sitting long before that. And, you know, I can see here, got little dust bunnies here. You can see, uh, again, 
If you're new to this and you just got this machine, don't let this bother you. This is normal. Uh, and the machine is not um, the machine is not damaged uh, necessarily from this. And it's it's basically what happens, you know, if you've ever seen a car that someone parked out in a field somewhere and it just sat. Machines don't like sitting. They go to sleep and you got to spend time waking them up. Or in this case, I do. So, okay, uh, and I have, this is a newer bobbin winding tire, so someone replaced that at some point. Uh, the original, I believe, was beige, and it was probably dry rotted, no big deal. So, what are we doing? We are going to start, and this is uh, the core of what I should have mentioned at the beginning of the video. So, I've shown this product to you before. Uh, this is the valve oil that I found in the music store. Again, it's sold for people who who need to lubricate the valves in their, uh, their, uh, you know, their brass instruments. I think, you know, saxophones and trumpets and so forth, uh, use, they use this. Anyway, I'm going to use this. And again, this is not sewing machine oil. It is not a lubricant and it's, it's not sold as a penetrant oil, but it has a mild odor to my sensitivity. You might be different. Don't trust some person on the internet telling you that something doesn't smell bad. You have to you have to give it the sniff test yourself because we all vary. Now, what am I doing? I am going to take this valve oil and I'm basically going to come around and just put it in places that I would normally put sewing machine oil. Now, if you're not sure, you can watch this video, of course, and your um, your um, your, your manual, you know, manuals back in the day showed you how to lubricate your own machine uh, before they before they quit making it possible for sewing machine owners. And this is essentially what I'm doing. I'm wanting to, let's get a little more height here. I basically, what I want to do here is I want to basically start getting this valve oil which I am using as a cleaning oil because it has it's not just all oil because you know I could you could say well why don't you just use sewing machine oil and sewing machine oil actually works really well as a uh, as a um, uh, as a lubricant when you want to wake up a machine but only if it's a mild case I have uh, worked to wake up enough 401s to know that almost every 401 I've ever touched needed, it needed extra time, extra care. But again, if you've got one or you're thinking about buying one, don't let that deter you because once this machine is woken up and you use it, you're good to go. It's not like you're gonna you know, spend the rest of your life doing this with this machine. But again, we are waking it up. I sometimes worry that people hear me talk, they see all the things I'm doing for a machine and they kind of wonder, oh God, am I going to have to do this stuff every time my machine needs maintenance? No. In fact, most of the maintenance you'll ever do on a machine is basically cleaning your feed dogs and uh, oiling the machine where, you know, when and where appropriate. So, so this is, I call this the pre-soak because this valve oil has a solvent in it. I'm going to let that solvent and oil sort of just work its way in. I'm, I've got my hand on the hand wheel here. And you can probably see parts moving just to kind of see if, if any of these parts, you know, it might help get the oil moved around. And again, you will not know exactly how long your machine's been sitting, but yeah, they sit for a long time. You know, it's, it's amazing to me that they all don't end up tossed somewhere but I'm, I'm really grateful that they that they they have not been okay so that was the top now that little flapping you're hearing is just the side door remember I think I mentioned this before never grab your machine by this it has tiny little aluminum hinges and if you grab your machine by this door pretty good chance you'll rip it off and you will be very unhappy you will not like that event. You won't like yourself as much. So try not to do that. Okay, now I'm giving you kind of a little bird's eye view here. So what am I gonna do? I know I have something here that doesn't wanna move. 
right? So I'm just going to put some of this right in here. And I'm probably going to have to go back and clean it again because I haven't taken this plate off yet. And uh, I can come in from the side. And now, you might be tempted to put oil in here. I would hold off for a moment because this area, and I cleaned out as much lint as I could, this area is, is just a magnet for lint. And if you put a lot of oil in here, you're going to end up, it's going to attract more lint. Uh, so we, when we oil this area, we want to be very judicious, very conservative with the oil. The race area, right, that, for those of you who don't know what I mean when I say race, the race area is this, you see this, this is the, um, this is the shuttle moving down here. And you'll notice the bobbin case is stable, or stationary, it doesn't move, because it's actually sitting on what looks like a little racetrack. And as the, as the shuttle turns, <clears throat> the bobbin case basically rests on it, and there's a spot where we can oil it. And that helps your bobbin case move and not have to, you don't have as much friction there. Where else can we, uh, but I'm going to hold off on that area there purp on purpose, okay? Once I have gotten my, um, once I have gotten my, uh, my needle plate off because my feed dog or bobbin plate lifter is moving again, then I'll be able to get in further and get more lint out because I suspect we're going to see some in there. In the meantime, let's take a look on the side and see what we can see here. How, let's just see how dirty it is. I see some old gummed oil. Not particularly bad. I've seen worse. Sometimes I see a lot of dust. Sometimes I don't. Let's get a little light here and see if I can... I've got actually got really good natural light today, but this area of a sewing machine is sometimes a little bit of a cave. All right, let's see. All right, what do we see here? We see some dust, old oil. Uh, Let's see if I can take cotton swab. You knew that was coming. Um, I think I, I may single-handedly handedly keep this cotton swab industry in business with all those I go through. Maybe you do too. Uh, so anyway, I'm just poking around here looking, uh, see if, and if there's any excess dust that I can take out because, again, if you start squirting oil and there's dust in there, it's not the end of the world. It's just more work for you to clean, right? Uh, and like I say, there's nothing shocking or surprising here, um, thankfully. <laughs> Occasionally, people have, have uh, you know, you find threads. You never know what you'll find in here, but you definitely want to... Um, you're basically doing a cursory glance to make sure there's nothing amiss, uh, particularly with threads. I recently had to deal with threads in this area, which is rare, but you can see I brought, what is this? Some kind of, I don't know what that is, fuzz, oily dirt fuzz. Um, and basically just trying to make sure that there's no excess dust. I'm not going to get it all and that's okay. And then, of course, remember to turn your hand wheel so you can get another another angle. Maybe another side. See, I'm getting more, more out there. And the other reason to to be aware of the dust. Most of your dust, of course, is down here in the in the in the feed dog area. Dust is something that, you know, it's like getting sand in a car engine. It, I can promise you a lot of the sewing machines we all enjoy, they've had a good gosh, they, some of them have had rough lives that people have not been, you know, so, so retentively caring of them the way I, I, uh, I, I and many of you can be, but the dust itself, uh, it just, you know, causes more wear, uh, don't panic. You could have dust in your machine. It could sew probably out, you know, sew for the next hundred years. Who knows? But 
you want to try to keep these areas clean because again, you are, uh, you don't want the dust uh, clogging anything up, right? So I'm not, right, right now I'm not cleaning. Normally I would take my alcohol and I will do this eventually and I go back and, you know, up and down and get some of the old oil. That's, that's old sewing machine oil that has, it has oxidized and turned uh, honey brown. Um, some of you, the first time you ever see that, you may think, oh no, there's rust. Uh, rust doesn't come off nearly as easy as old oil, so alcohol will quickly tell you if you have rust. Thankfully, I have run into rust before, but it's not as common as you would think, thankfully, and that's mostly because uh, if the machines were stored indoors, you know, not in a damp basement or something, it's usually, uh, oh, got a bunch of, bunch of fuzz up here in the top. Uh, it's usually not uh, that prevalent. You'll sometimes get some rusted, you know, some of these nickel plated or uh, chrome plated pieces will rust over time, stuff like this. But uh, usually if you have rust in a sewing machine, it's, it's either, it's, it's usually really bad or not. <laughs> and uh, so that's, that's essentially, uh, let's see here. But it's usually old oil. That's usually, and that's 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 preferable because old oil, you can get off, and it's a lot easier to deal with. As long as the machine's not frozen, you can deal with old oil a lot more easily than you can rust. Although there are ways to get rid of rust, and we've we've talked about that in other videos too. All right, aha. Well, I'm not going to put any more in here. Of this stuff because it, as I mentioned in the one of the other videos where I was showing I was using it it's very thin and if you put a bunch you're gonna end up with a big oily mess either on your floor or I've got a little board here under the machine but uh, less is more here if you need more you'll know because what you've put in won't really work or it won't work well enough but sometimes you know the time matters and that's part of this little experiment. I want to let this material just soak in. I'm not even trying to get anything to really move here. All right, where have we not? Those of you who watched my videos know we're not done. Are we? Oh no, not close, not even close. Okay, I'm gonna move the machine. Notice I'm grabbing my machine right here, we're over here on the hand wheel and down below. Do not grab the here because this door doesn't, I could tape it, but this door does not want to stay closed because it relies on the lid when the lid's on. So when I tilt it back, right, watch what you're doing. If you tilt it back and you're not watching the door, do not damage that little door. It'll be your fault. Okay, so I'm going to hold on to this and I'm just going to hold the door over here with my left hand just gently until I turn the machine over on its back. And then I can just let the door hang there, no big deal. Just be aware, okay? So I'm now gonna lower our perspective down here. Uh, and this, of course, those of you who know Singer machines from this period know that they use these lovely metal pans and they did this because it was a nice feature. Uh, one of the only companies to do this, if you know of other companies that did it, let me know. So that was the little felt uh, washer that, that actually is there so you don't scrape the paint off your lovely pan. Now, underneath, you will see, no surprise, <laughs> this is the felt pad that uh, Singer installed. Many of you who know these machines know this. They installed this pad for this very purpose when you oiled your machine to keep the oil from getting on the customer's floor at home. They had this little pad. And once you, once you are dealing with a 75 year old pad, if this in fact is the original, it might be, it's kind of stinky, right? Uh, metal doesn't absorb odor, but you know, oil soaked pads do. So I'll be removing this. I've shown in other videos before how to do that and how you can order these online or you can just cut your own. Save the old one. Don't tear it up. Get it off. Many times they'll come off 
intact if they're really soaked in oil and then just you know trace around it and use it as a template and uh, that's what I'll do I used to buy them and now I just make my own it's just you know uh, it's easier and cheaper uh, they're not very expensive though you can probably get them 10 12 bucks okay so the other thing that pan does is it helps to some degree keep dust uh, out of this area which is a nice thing of course you see underneath all that glorious singer steel look at those those two gears there and then you have two over here right similar not the same similar to the 201 uh, very different machine but it had that level of of cost involved right okay now what am I doing here I'm not pulling the motor out at this time but what I am doing uh, and I'm not putting this oil, this uh, valve oil on the gears. They don't need it. What we do need to do is everywhere that you would put sewing machine oil, let's put this product, okay? And, you know, just follow your way around. Uh, and you'll notice some of these areas, I've done these machines enough that I, I know where the areas are. But if you're not sure, let's say you're doing it the first time, put your hand on the hand wheel and just gently rock it back and forth and you will see metal parts moving against metal parts and that's that tells you something that says oh okay that's probably a good lubrication point there oh look here a little bunny <laughs> a little dust bunny hanging there oh okay so we have uh, now this this big sort of lever is attached to that feed dog lever that is that is not wanting to behave at the moment so uh, I'm going to go here there's a hole that you can see from the front and it actually sits right where there's a um, there's a connection point with the lever and the the lever up top and then right here this piece moves or supposed to when it's working so let's just put some oil right there okay now you say well why don't you see if it moves it's not ready right this is a process Oh, I'm looking for a culinary metaphor. If you've ever made soup or stew, you know that it really takes time to get good results. You don't just boil stuff and make soup or stew. You kind of let it simmer, right? And so that's what we're doing here. We're just going to let this this little product uh, that I just accidentally noticed in a sewing, in a music shop once, and I am going to let it sit and sit and we are going to see what it thinks about all this I'm hoping now some of these you know these pieces are moving this machine's not frozen and you might say well if it's not frozen why are you going to all of this length you know why don't you just just clean it with alcohol and get going I'm doing this because I you know the old saying once bitten twice shy I have worked on enough Singer 400 machines that um, almost every one of them is extra fussy and extra sticky until it's overhauled, until it's restored. Again, um, I, I take great pains because I always worry. People say, oh, well, I don't want to use that. That machine's going to be fussy. Not once, it, once it's in good shape. They're fussy when they've been left to sleep or hibernate in this case. This thing's been asleep for a long time. So that's basically what we're doing here. All I'm doing is um, kind of giving it a chance to slowly wake up and think about it when you first wake up in the morning if somebody grabbed a hold of you and said hey let's go outside for a run <laughs> you might not like it either right so these machines um, to, to, to just emphasize it's these machines this machine it's not broken it's asleep and it's been sleeping for a while and just like you, you know, you need to get up and kind of move a little bit here and there. And then, you know, you walk in, you walk in another room, you get your breakfast, and then maybe you get ready to go out and do, if you're a runner or something, I'm not. But if you, uh, you get the point. Movement is something that should be done slowly when you have been still for a long time, just like when we are still uh, asleep all over the night. And that's the best metaphor I can give you for these machines because, um, if you will be patient with them, once this machine is woken up, I unless any you know, bizarre, strange thing happens, I expect this sewing machine to sew up a storm 
and to truly be uh, an heirloom for the future. Again, many of these machines, they get passed over and ignored because they don't run, and they don't run because they weren't cared for. But, but all they need is that TLC that I've shown in so many of these videos, and once you, uh, once you give them that, they, are, uh, they have a new lease on life, right? Um, so I hope this was helpful, and I hope this was helpful for the machine because I've, not, I've used this product before. You saw me use it on the Kenmore that I was uh, trying to loosen up for a, a client. They had brought it to me, and that Kenmore had other issues. It had all, the, all those thread issues. But this machine, I decided to just, from the get-go, not even trying. I'm not using any alcohol yet. I, I basically haven't done anything to it. And I thought, why don't we give it a nice pre-soak? And I think I'm just going to let it sit for a week and then see if this is kind of an experiment. Will this help shorten the amount of time it takes me to get things moving? Because I allowed this, this, this uh, solvent oil product, which is uh, basically what it is, to kind of take its time to dissolve some of the gunk. Um, again, this would work on any vintage sewing machine that's, that hasn't been run in a while. I, I'm really kind of, you know, taking a shine to this product, but I, I thought, well, I can't think of too many candidates that would be better than a Singer 401A. And if you've ever tried to overhaul a Singer 401A, they are such great machines. It's usually not the first machine I would suggest uh, that you try this on if you're new. Now, if someone gives you one or you inherited one, by all means, have at it. Uh, and you'll be fine. You'll be able to do it. But if you are interested in restoring sewing machines and you've never touched one before, um, a good old-fashioned dedicated straight stitch singer in, in, you know, so many of them in the, in the black color, those are great machines because they are, any machine is, is a learning process, but at least, you know, you're, you're learning uh, arithmetic and not, this is, this is the trigonometry of the, of the, uh, uh, of the sewing restoration world. It's when I did my first 401A, um, it took me a lot longer. And, and again, it's, uh, I think the only thing that's ever taken me longer are the Berninas. Uh, so again, all of these machines deserve love and attention and gentle waking up and, and they all should be preserved. And, all, you know, people who watch my channel, you know, you've got fans of every brand out there. And I totally support your efforts. Just remember that. Be patient. Don't get in a hurry. I don't care what you're restoring. Um, if you have something like this machine, just remember there are many areas. And take your time. Think of it as a zone, right? We have the undercarriage. We have um, gears to grease. We have, you know, be pulling the motor out and checking it and so forth. Uh, there's no belt on these, right? That was one of the great features of these machines is they are beltless. Uh, it was, it, that's how they were marketed as, as awesome. Um, and then, you know, you go section by section. But anyway, if any of you have uh, seen my videos and tr uh, thought about trying this, if you have a music store, and if you don't, you can probably go online and order this stuff. Um, so I have never done the pre-soak with this, but I'm going to try it. And in about a week or so, uh, we'll take a look. We'll make another video and see, you know, did it help? Uh, worth a shot because, uh, again, you must always do this yourself and decide what uh, you can tolerate. But of all those products I have used, those penetrant oils that can be effective, I do not like stinky smells. They give me a headache. And this product uh, is not so bad. Uh, but always do you know, check and verify yourself. You may hate this stuff. You may think this valve oil stinks to high heaven, but uh, I have found it to be a lot gentler on my senses. And so hopefully it will be for you too. Thanks for watching everyone and uh, stay tuned. We'll, we'll get this old 401 up and running and hopefully we'll have a debut video at some point. And uh, you will get to see all of the magic that this machine did that convinced so many sewers, 1950s, to pay a fortune for it. Thanks again.